Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. We're back today and I'm here with Dan and we would really love to welcome back a former podcast guest and our friend and ministry partner, Jimmy McGee, the CEO and president of the Impact Movement. And as we have been in this series on qualities of a well-lived story and we've been journeying through what does it mean for someone to exemplify a story that really embodies what we understand to be the gospel of Jesus Christ, one who is in pursuit of justice, who loves mercy, who walks humbly, and is bringing people along. And so, as we come to today, we're really going to be leaning into these characteristics of curiosity and commitment. And Jimmy McGee, um, I would consider you a mentor, a teacher, and a friend. And I see you as someone who embodies these characteristics in all their complexity and would love to just dive in more with you. So, Dan, tell me, uh, you know, in some ways what you see and, and what draws you to this conversation with Jimmy. Well, he's a troubled man. I mean, l- let's just say, you know, it, it, you, you can't trust any human being who's not deeply troubled. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, whose heart is really pure. I mean, whose heart really longs for goodness, individually, corporately, culturally, longs to see redemption. And when you see those two things, a broken human being who's got a holy heart that grows other people to become what 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 they're meant to be in the context of following Jesus. So we, we've had we've had some wild days with this gentleman, uh, opening the door really truly to a far deeper understanding of racial trauma, uh, of the reality of uh, just uh, not just social inequality, but a, a, a diabolic commitment to doing harm. Uh, to people of color, so this has been this has been a life changing presence uh, in each of our lives. But I'll just say my life. Uh, so it's it's such an honor, Jimmy, to invite you to uh, begin to address the question of how did you become who you are. And I know that's a loaded question, but when we begin to ask of you, how did you become so deeply curious? So, uh, undoubtedly, you know, I'm going to mention a couple of books, so I'm just going <laughs> to just say that out there. Get uh, your but, pens out, people. Get your pens out. <laughs> but I, I will say this, that um, I would say I'm moving from fragmentation to wholeness, that I was a very fragment individual when I was coming out of college. Um, I did not have very strong connection between who I was as a person. Uh, I, I saw streams of who I was when I was younger. Of course, one of them was an athlete. I loved to run and play basketball. Uh, I'm not so much of an athlete that I now I bike and I walk. Um, so that was a part of my life. I think the c- central part of my identity was I continue to think about it in three different spaces. It was being black in the United States, being urban because Atlanta is the smallest city I've ever lived in. And so I've always lived in these spaces and then also being Christian. And quite frankly, they were siloed with very little connection between the three of them. And it caused a lot of discouragement within me because when one aspect of my humanity was uh, challenged or violated, I could not find other parts to come to his rescue. So with, with me as a black person, even in Christian spaces was violated. I didn't see that Christian aspect build a bridge to come to my rescue. And so, um, I wanted to grow and I was fearful of just following wind. So it, right at a very young age, I decided before I go any further, I needed to write my own statement of faith. 
And so I wrote my own statement of faith. And I, I kept down, these are the basics. I'm not going to go way in deep. Now, it was kind of long, but it was still, it was malleable. And there were certain key things that I wanted to do. And then I made decisions about where I was served, not based on the capacity of the organization, but the capacity of the organization to help me to discover who I was. So it wasn't about doing something. It was about me in eventually becoming someone, becoming who God created me to be. And, you know, I'm reading this book now. It's Robert Benson's first book. Hmm. I'm a big fan of his. But uh, I'm glad I waited now. It's called Between the Dreaming and Coming True. Mm -hmm. And he, he talks about that when we introduce ourselves with people, we we'll always talk about well, what we do and that we've got something wrong there because what we do is not always a case of who we are. And for me, what I am doing is a part of who I am. So I am dealing with issues of making whole people. And so what happened to me over these past 25, 30 years was this idea of realizing that I didn't know everything there was in this faith. And so I kept seeking out mentors, whether it was in my organization or out at the time, who I felt like could help me grow in understanding. And they closed the gap of these three personalities until they finally mm -hmm. became at peace in one body. And so that in my body, I am black, I am urban, I am Christian, and I am whole, but I'm becoming more whole every day. And that's, that's what happened to me. And uh, if I could just take a brief moment, a significant part of this happened uh, in the early 90s. Uh, I was working for InterVarsity at the time, and it was a very popular book um, called More Than Equals by Spencer Perkins and Chris Rice that came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the head of our campus ministry nationally sent me the book and said, hey, I want you to read this book. What do you think about it? So I got the book. I opened it up. I threw it on the bed and I went about my life. And my wife came back to me and said, Jimmy, you ought to read this book. I just read it. I think you'll find it curious. And when I began to see, it was to me a roadmap to how evangelicals were pursuing the issue of race. And I was troubled by the book. These guys are six hours from my home, so I decided that I was going to engage them. I wasn't just going to just read the book. I was going to take my urban project and engage them in this dialogue, and we began to go back and forth about this because I felt like some of their conclusion was wrong. And I was still unsettled in, in evangelicalism of how they were addressing the issue of race because they were doing it anachronistically. They, they weren't aware of what God was doing historically through believers who adamantly loved Jesus, but would never call themselves evangelical. And I know people hard, it's hard to phantom that, but there's plenty of people who are dogmatically committed to Jesus and aren't evangelical. And so uh, I was watching Oprah one day and a guy named C.T. Vivian was on there. Mm. And I fell in love with his presentation uh, I had later put on in my mind that I had actually went through his training when I was in college through his partner at the time, Charles King, who's unrelated to Dr. King. And I met Charles King before he died of cancer. So I pursued C.T. Vivian for about two years until I finally met him in uh, 1995, 25 years ago. And I would tell you Part of who I was and my curiosity was the idea of being true to who God made me was as a black urban Christian. And that meant there were certain things in me that I desired to be that white evangelicalism was almost forcing itself upon me of what they desired me to be. And what I found in C.T. Vivian, and I'll be brief, was the embodiment of of, of, of what I wanted to be in a black man. Uh, I saw in him uh, this, this incredible combination of Tom Skinner, Dr. King, and Malcolm X, mm -hmm. of how you can be nonviolent, direct, uh, masculine, and pastoral, and sensitive, and lucid. Um, when he died, uh, when I used to visit him, he had over 5,000 books in his library. And uh, I was already on a reading tear 
and he just pushed me further. Well, you, you've chosen to do something that I think most people wouldn't even think about doing. And that is, if somebody intrigues you, you go after them. You go knock on their door. Uh, oh, absolutely. You, you invite yourself for coffee and you begin conversations. Oh, absolutely. Robert Benson, let me give you a quick story. This is a true story. Robert Benson, his first book I read was Living Prayer. It changed my life because mm. there's another aspect to me that really is drawn through spiritual formation because I've gone through burnout. I've actually been depressed in my life. And I felt like what evangelicalism also didn't give me was the idea that Jesus really called me into a relationship with him and not for me to be his pure slave to just do his bidding, that he really wanted to know me and I should get to know him. So I read Living Living Prayer, and then I read The Echo Within. Those two books were right off the top. Now, I got like eight of his books. And so uh, while I'm reading Living Prayer, I have a speaking engagement in Nashville. So I send him an email and call him and say, is it possible that I could meet with you in Nashville? So I get back home. This is before we have smartphone. I have my flip phone and I see this voice message from an unrecognized number. And it said, it was Robert Benson saying, I apologize. I was unavailable to meet with you. So fast forward, I'm now the president of Impact. I'm peddling his books. I'm advertising it. And I have to go to Nashville. And I said, I'm going to see if I can meet with him. And uh, sure enough, we met in one of the coffee houses that he describes in one of his books. Mm -hmm. And um, I told my wife, I said, hey, I know you read one of his books. Would you like to go with me? And she said, no, I'm going to let you have your bromance to yourself. (laughs) And I drove over and we met in his coffee house um, for about two hours. He signed most of my favorite books by him. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then he rebuked me in the midst of just talking to me about his life. And so I've done that over and over again. You name people, John Stott, Eugene Peterson, um, black people. I mean, I think of James Orange and people around Dr. King. All these people played a significant role in my life. Well, I'm I'm so grateful that you are not a shy man and that you have, in many ways, followed the curiosity, but your own brokenness, to desire something far more. And I, I, I don't know how to ask it better than... What do you understand with regard to your life that has brought you to this level of intrigue and curiosity? I don't, I mean, I, I hang out with academics and uh, we, we do a lot of reading, but I've never known any human being who does more reading than you do. How, how, how did that come to be? You know, I, I, I would have to give blame to my mom and dad first, um, when I was in school, they recognized early on, and I think it was intuitive. I don't think it was really intentional, but they just knew there were some things I just was not getting in school. And so they bought me a book called Great Negroes Past and Present that I later on bought for my wife because she had never heard of it as a child. And she said, I would love to see that book. And so as an adult, I buy that book for her. And from that, when I finally went to college, And actually, I got addicted on in the arts of sciences college. It it was a new drug of introducing me to concepts and ideas that I knew I didn't know. And so therefore, I had to learn more. Uh, And I started reading in my course, my courses. And then when I recommitted my life, I remember going to the Christian bookstore and said, I need to have my Christian faith be as strong as my academic life. And I I didn't know where to start. I didn't have this, this, this plethora of people I could choose from. And I I remember going in articulating what I'm kind of pining for. And the person said, well, here's a good book you might consider. And it was by Fritz Rittenauer called How to Be a Christian Without Being Religious. And it was over the book of Romans. And that was the first book. And I read like five or six of his books after that. Mm -hmm. Well, before we go much further, I just wanted to loop back to something just to acknowledge. um, I'm just aware that C.T. Vivian, and you, you mentioned it, but he passed away on July 17th. And it's one thing for those of us who know him as this icon of the civil rights movement, as a person who has lived just a profound life of integrity. It's also another thing to lose someone that you actually know and pursued and, and had relationship with. So I'm sorry for your loss, um, Uh, especially at such a time as this. 
Yeah, he's a general that we need now. He was 95. His birthday is next week. He would have been 96. And on his 95th birthday, uh, I got my wife to make some ginger snap cookies and I went by his home and gave it to him. And I can still remember getting it to his house. It was pouring down rain and I came through the garage and he's dressed as always in a suit. And we sit down and uh, at this time, his daughter and son-in-law are living in the house with him. And I gave him some cookies. So he saw the gifts. He begins to take the ribbon apart. And he started eating the cookies, and they were still almost warm from coming out of the oven. Mm-hmm. And I remember telling him, I said, well, you know those are homemade. And as only he has always said, he looked at me, he said, is there any other kind? And he <laughs> began to eat them and enjoy them. Um, I had vast amounts of conversations with him in his home, in restaurants, uh, for seven years, facilitating um training with him within a varsity. And then he introduced me to his son who took over some of the mantle of that training in a varsity and now works with us now in impact. Um, uh, It is a huge loss. Um, And, but you know, I've, I've lost some other guys. I've never deleted them from my phone. Um, I can't forget them now. Uh, They all made a huge impact in my life. And with, with great opportunity comes great responsibility of saying, how can I pass on C.T. Vivian, Tom Skinner, Elwood Ellis, Steve Hayner? How can I pass these people on to the next generation? And that's that's been my conundrum that I continue to answer. Which I think makes this connection to commitment, um, this connection between curiosity to commitment. And, you know, one thing I so deeply respect, even about how you've shared how you came to be a curious man and this language around wholeness. And I think it's just important for our listeners to hear so often, so many of our Christian concepts have been co-opted in ways that are actually detrimental. And when I think about the word integrity, um, when I, I, I think that's what I hear you saying, the sense of what does it mean to have the fragmented parts be integrated um, as we go and as a part of our healing and, um, as a part of what it means to be faithful um, and to have the capacity to bear the responsibility um, of what we're given. And I think that's one of the things I just so deeply appreciate about you and would want to ponder more with you. I do experience you as someone who is deeply committed to passing on all the gifts you've been given like for the sake of of life and, and the gospel of Jesus. And so, I'm just curious— um, because I hear in you the question of like I'm not I'm not always sure how to do that. Um, what is it that compels you to keep trying, to keep imagining? Well, one thing is Mrs. Dorsey. She was my fourth and eighth grade teacher, and she used to say to me, "There's no such thing as a bad question." So she always tells me I should entertain questions, no matter my opinion of the question or who is asking, uh, and so. What I've been taught, good leaders are not people who provide answers. Good leaders are those who provide questions. Because uh, one of the things I've adopted being in your world from a friend who was on us before was Derek McNeil, is about the opportunity for people to do their own work. And I really find that what C.T. Vivian did for me, he didn't just give me something. He gave me the, the, the wherewithal to do my own work. And everybody kept letting me know that, I had work to do. And so this curiosity is to realize two things. And I think it's connecting to the Allender Center's notion about evil. And so when we're born in this world, we're troubled in two ways. We're troubled inwardly just by coming through the gate of the womb with sin. That's something inside of us. But I think the other part of it is we're unaware of the evil that we're engaging once we come out of that gate and how it confronts us and shapes us. And so my idea now is I don't divorce my Christian faith with other disciplines. I don't divorce it from history, sociology, anthropology, or even economics now. I actually try to see the attachment because using the term intersectionality, if Jesus is really Lord, then he's Lord of everything. Yes. So therefore, I got to find out. What's his opinion and how does he speak 
into everything because mm-hmm. that's the kind of world that I want to prepare my students to be. You know, we changed the mission statement of our organization of saying the very last phrase is that the impact movement desires to make disciples of black students in every aspect of their life. So the, the very tension that I brought in my own life as a CEO is the very tension that I want to give to my students. I want to let them know I'm not giving them a pass that they can just go to Sunday school and think they've done good going to church every week. Hmm. I don't really care about that, to be really honest. What I do care about is their intersectionality of what their life looks like Monday through Saturday, because two hours of Sunday does not enough for me to get happy about. And I want them to go to church. And I want them to be a part of a Christian community, but I also want them to see the interwovenness of life and not compartmentalize that. And that's something that they miss. And so that's something that I am forever doing. And so if I'm really honest with you, um, I would love to have a conversation with Jimmy McGee at 28 years old versus a Jimmy McGee now who's 58. And I'm telling you, we would be some knockdown drag outs. <laughs> so I saw a, a tweet the other day about a guy who said the summation of Jesus coming to this world was to die for sin and to save us from hell. Now, the 28 year old Jesus said spot on, right on. The 58 year, year old guy would say, no, Jesus came into this world to die. Yes, for sin and to not let us go to heaven, but that was not the end. That was a means to another end, and that's his kingdom, and that's a full life, and, and combating evil. There's a lot more than what that 28-year-old Jimmy would have said, and I'm discovering now that's a lot of the conflict we're even facing today, that we've truncated things to such a simplistic state that I know it's not true. It, it, I know it's not true experientially. I know it's not true when I read the scriptures. And I know it's not true because the ruin I see in people's lives. I, I want to hear what that 28-year-old is going to say back to you. Let, let's, let's, I, I want to hear a conversation between those two, the 58-28. Oh, oh, the 28-year-old would say, dude, first of all, the only thing you should be concerned about is the scripture itself. The, that 28 year old was a fragmented 28 year old because no one connected the dots of how Jesus saving us from sin and not having us go to heaven was really connected to every aspect of his life. That 28 year old would, could, could play basketball and could cuss like a drunk sailor on the court because Jesus didn't play basketball. Jesus was in Bible studies. So why are you even introducing this notion that Jesus can hoop with you? And so he, he led a fragment life because those who were discipling him only gave the best of what they knew. And they didn't model that type of integration. And so that's what happened to me. Well, and it, in the response then back to you, uh, that 28-year-old may have been uh, as you describe him, somewhat bold, maybe even a touch arrogant, but nonetheless, he was open. He was seeking. He was actually knowing something about his world that was not whole. So, what if you can kind of look back and say, what are the transitions that helped you, in one sense, stay faithful in a calling, addressing not in the entirety, but a large portion of your world has been coming to grips with the reality of racial trauma. Uh, And you told me, uh, one of our first meetings, uh, you said, people who begin to address this often die. And there are a lot of white folk who start on this and begin to get a sense of the complexity, the heartache, and from my standpoint, the kind of spiritual warfare that's involved in gauging this. And I know from my own life how I have dabbled, stepped in, stepped back, uh, but you've stepped in, you stay in, and it's more than just the inevitability of, of your own racial reality. There is an integrity to, in one sense, mix things up to create disruption. Is that a fair 
reading of you? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think a phrase that I don't use as often now, but it's still true of me, is that I'm never afraid to process. So if I'm in process, then that means I've got to go through the process. I can't rush it. I can't accelerate it. And quite frankly, to accelerate my process actually brings more damage to me. And so I need to go that. So one of the earlier things that I became aware of as a 28-year-old, I will say this, and I think this is true, that it's still maintained in me. I can read and see people in Scripture that God engaged at 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old individuals and he had this dynamic um, peak that he was moving them towards, whether it was to be king, whether it was to be a prophet, it didn't matter. Uh, he, whether it was going to be in Egypt like Joseph, didn't really matter. But the idea was God knew when he told them that's what he wanted to be, that they weren't ready even at that young age. And mm -hmm. that there was a process to prepare them there, a process that would help them understand and become acquainted with humility, a process that would make them aware of integrity and, and, and also not fear darkness. See, and I think that's where people get out of it. They, they are afraid of darkness. And the interesting thing that I know Skinner taught me, and I think you, you brought up again recently that I understand is that for whatever reason, we really think of the Christian life is actually avoiding darkness. Actually, the Christian life is really seeking darkness. It's, it's, it's moving to put light in dark spaces Amen. and to right. engage that. And the 28-year-old knew that. And the 28-year-old, no matter, and I, t I tell you, even though he would have engaged me 30 years later, <laughs> the problem with the 28-year-old, he also knew he didn't believe everything he was saying at that point. Mm. He knew that there was some stuff he just didn't know. And so... And, and one of the things I remember in my life early on, I, I had just hit maybe my second year on staff with the university. And then all of a sudden they started saying, hey, I want you to be an area director, a middle manager. And I said, I've only been on this job for two years, and now you want to put me over somebody. And I said, I'm not prepared to do that. I, I think it, what it would have done, it wouldn't have fed my humility. It would have fed my arrogance. And I decided to withdraw that and to really push it. And most people don't realize that for 10 years, I, I was just a regular campus staff and a director of an urban program, but I had national influence because of my passion and my curiosity and my intolerance of darkness and wrong. And, I, and that's what pushed me to that place. So you caused trouble. Yeah, John Lewis says it's good trouble. Good trouble. And uh, I, I still think there's not enough of that around right now. Yeah, but Also, you, Dan, it takes one to know one. I mean, <laughs> exactly. You don't get to, like, throw that out, like, you know, just oh, saying, well. this, is a, you know, this is a group right here of, of good troublemakers. I, I, would, I, would, I was going to return to you, Rachel, and say, it takes one to know one to know one. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to start a 12-step 12, uh, 12 group. <laughs> no, no, we need more trouble. And yet, uh, again, what I've, what I've sensed and seen about you is that you, you can engage incredible heartache and deep injustice and bring both passion but playfulness and humor. Uh, not, not cruel humor, not mockery, but you seem to have the ability uh, to bring... Um, uh, well, grief with those who have grief and, and laughter with those who have laughter. Uh, again, has that been noted before? Yeah, it's been noted, but I, I, I don't think that's something that is indicative of me as an individual as much as the community I was born in. Uh, I think they've, they've, I've inherited uh, a group of people who know what uh, resilience and perseverance and grief and laughter, and they can hold all those things at the same time without dropping them. Mm -hmm. And and I've been going out of my way to learn that from my elders and my griot. And you know, I think about my remaining years. I, I'm the CEO of this organization, but not because I thought one day I was going to be such a person. Uh, my problem is that I, I don't know how much life I have left, 
And losing C.T. Vivian tells me we need an army. And I'm not, uh, and I don't know if we're going to get as vast an army as what the United States have, but we need uh, some Navy SEALs, some special forces. Uh, and that's why I actually live now. I live today because I realize my life is going to end and I need some other people that I need to pour this stuff that I got into them because we need replacements. We need people. You know, I, uh, in 2016, I had an interview with uh, Brian Stevenson. He wouldn't let us inter- He wouldn't let us record his presentation, but he did let us record an interview. And I remember sitting down with him and I told him, I said, Brian, uh, you shaved all the hair off your face and head. So everybody thinks that I'm older than you, but I know better. But I told him, I said, as much as you're doing a good work, you're going to die. And I'm not happy about that because we actually need people to replace you. And I said, the reason why you're at the impact movement is not because of what you do at EJI. It's not because of, you know, you're a great orator and your ideas are exceptional. The idea is that I'm hoping that some of our students will be stimulated to know that they need to replace you. Because once you die, we need more of you. And uh, that's what I feel like is my greatest burden right now. And I just want to say as, as one who comes um, in some ways behind both of you, um, it, to me, this is a huge part of what it means to live a well-lived story, to have an imagination, to know that the work will continue and must continue and that it is that urgent. Um, and I would just say I don't encounter many leaders who actually under, have that kind of commitment to live into the kingdom of God, to know um, that part of being faithful and part of of being curious and part of being kind and part of being courageous and part of pursuing justice and loving mercy and walking humbly is to make disciples so that the work continues, is to give away what you've been given. And I think it takes such like biblical hope (laughs) and such um, courage and, and tremendous humility to entrust to people who are those 28 year olds who, you know, want to have that conversation with you and to entrust them with things to, to help them grow and to learn and in many ways to give away authority and to give away power. And um, I just, as someone who has benefited so deeply from both of you, want to say thank you. Thank you for being men. Uh, in my life and in the life of many people that I can say, like, you know, as Derek McNeil was telling our staff the other day, just reflecting on this, this language of like, well done, like good and faithful servant. I hope you can receive those words today. Even as we all know, there is, there's much to be done and, and much yet to be lived um, in these ways that we seek to be people who reflect the story of God in our own complex, broken, and beautiful lives. Well, I, I know, thank you, Rachel, for, for, for both of us. I, I'm a hungry man, and I, I want more. I, exactly. If, if Jesus is who he is, then I know I've got very little to Jesus, uh, and I want more. And I look to people who seem to have that interplay of they are complex, broken, and very beautiful. And Jimmy McGee is one of those. Uh, Two things before we end. First is, Jimmy, you do a lot. uh, But how how can people who are listening to this podcast get access to some of the remarkable work you do? Uh, You know, uh, basically, tell us a little bit about your live streaming. Well, it, there's a couple of things that I can tell you that we're doing. Uh, we're doing uh, Facebook Lives. We started March 26, and the idea was how can we be a dispenser of information to help people interpret life? Uh, certainly the pandemic, but even now with the trauma that's happening, the deaths of Breonna Taylor, of uh, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Arbery. Let's say their names and not forget them. And we've been doing this over and over again. And we've been trying to pay attention to what's happening in the real uh, uh, space. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed about 
where we need to grow in this world. And so right now we're dealing with uh, this whole conflict of white evangelicalism engaging the issue of race. And, and we feel like we got to get it head on. And so if they would watch us on our impact movement channels or uh, on YouTube or on our Facebook live, they can see that. We're also beginning to train our staff or our students rather through digital spaces. So we just completed our first national digital impact leadership Institute. And we have two more. There's going to be on the seventh and eighth and 14th and 15th. where we're really trying to build leaders who are curious and the overarching theme we talk about is becoming because we want our students that they to understand that they live in the present tense, not in the past tense or future tense, that becoming is something that we're always doing. And that's true for me and it's true for both of you. So I think that that's a great space. I think the other space that they would see if we, once we get out of this pandemic, um, they can begin to see and understand um, the partnership between us, the Allen Center, the impact movement. I think we did something that, uh, it's only been done once in our in terms of our partnership, but it's something that must, I think, if we're going to be responsible, and that means the responsibility is bigger than us organizationally, but to the kingdom, we got to figure out how do we help people really move forward to handle race trauma and this good news. And I think it's one of the um, conundrums that historically believers have troubled with in this country. Um one brief story I would tell you about C.T. Vivian. Again, I remember talking to one of my colleagues about my introduction to C.T. and what he was teaching me. And uh, they came up and they said, oh, so is C.T. a Vivian or Christian now? And because they were leveraging and using their white evangelical, very truncated idea, did he say a prayer? Did he say these words? And then, and then, because it got to be the words that, that people understand and believe in to say that. And what they fail to realize is that that man had a profound faith and, and that his life was really showing us what it meant to be Christian versus in articulating uh, a thesis. And so I think that's some of the work that we are, have yet to do between us organizationally that I think responsibly, I think we could really shift a lot of practitioners in a way to engage fragmentation to engage wholeness of the good news and to engage that it's not something to be done. It's something to be, and through their beings, we can facilitate change. Uh, amen. Uh, what we did uh, together in Montgomery, I, 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 if we don't get back to that, it will be one of those griefs that I don't think I can bear. Well, before we end, uh, we've not talked about this, but let me see if this is an idea that you'd be open to Jimmy. Um, uh, you need money. Uh, I'm 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 fairly assured as an organization. So yes. so you know for those who are listening who have a lot of money, uh, Jimmy and I will show up at your house post COVID, uh, <laughs> exactly. and I and I will cut your lawn, and Jimmy and I will have a conversation with you, your family, with anyone you want to invite. Fifty thousand. Uh, that's the entry. We'll play a little poker uh, and see where that goes. Uh, is that something that you'd be open to, Jimmy? I'm definitely open to anything <laughs> like that. We could play a little poker. We could go to the movies. We do a couple of different things. Yeah, I'll we could do some, you know, but, you know, and if, if, if you only have 44, 43,000, we're open. We're open to negotiate. But, exactly. but uh, we, we have a long term. Uh, heart and uh, relationship with Impact and with Jimmy McGee. So we will be inviting you, sir, to be part of more conversations. Thank you. Thank you, you curious, committed man. Thank you. I wanted to take a moment as we as we depart to tell you about a few opportunities that I really want to make sure you know about. So if you've been looking for more ways to get involved or are interested in diving into some of your own story work, we wanted to let you know about some exciting new opportunities happening here at the Allender Center. I don't know if you've already heard, but we just launched a brand new online course called To Be Told with the one and only Dan Allender. It's the same content as our conference, but now available for you to watch at home at your own pace. If you've ever found yourself asking, where is God leading me? Or why do I keep repeating the same patterns and ending up in the same types of relationships? I cannot recommend this course enough. You will be invited to love boldly, make sense of your story, find healing, and make changes that last. Speaking of changes, 
We've had quite a few over the past few months, as many of you know, and one has been that many of our trainings and workshops for the year ahead are now being offered virtually. So if you've not been able to attend our certificate and narrative-focused trauma care level one because of travel requirements, this is a truly unique opportunity, which takes place over the course of four weekends throughout the year and offers training to therapists, pastors, ministry leaders, stay-at-home moms, engineers, and many other advocates committed to working on behalf of healing and redemption. You get to learn from members of our teaching staff, and you participate in a healing process yourself with a group of people under a seasoned facilitator. The certificate require applications, so check that out. You can find that on our website at theallendercenter.org, along with information about our new online course. The Allender Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Thank you.